Hi, I'm Lanise Brothers, a registered nutritionist, women's health, hormone, and menstrual cycle coach, and the founder of Eat Love Move, a nutrition and well being practice. This is the Period Story Podcast, where in each episode, I sit down with a guest to talk about their period story. We get behind some of the myths and misconceptions about periods and so much more. Now, on to today's guest. On today's episode, we have Natalie Costa, who is an award-winning coach, author, and founder of Power Thoughts, a coaching service she created to give children the power over their own thoughts. With a background in psychology and having spent 12 years within the educational sector, as well as becoming an accredited performance coach, Power Thoughts was born, which blends her past experience and deep understanding of children and their needs, now providing them with the tools to help them cope and thrive in the modern world. Supporting children from as young as five, Natalie has delivered Power Thoughts to over 6,500 children within schools and online. Her programs are designed to help children recognize that they don't have to respond to every thought that they think or react to everything that they feel. By doing this, they are able to grow in confidence, feel happier, and be more robust in dealing with the pressures of school, exams, transitioning, making friends, and all the other things that affect our young children today. This was such a brilliant episode. Natalie gives some amazing tips to help us as we transition into a new school year, which will be starting for some of us, no matter if we're kids are in school or at home. And I have been using some of the tips that she gave with my son. And I really encourage you to listen to the episode and really enjoy the wisdom that Natalie shares. I hope you enjoy. Welcome to the show. Let's start off by getting into the story of your first period. Can you tell us what happened? Oh, yeah. So um, I think I was about 12. No, I was 13. I was 13. And it was round, round about my birthday. I remember it was winter because I'm from South Africa. So it was um, June is my birthday and it's, it's cold. It's winter. And I remember going to Lou and I came out and I was just like, in abs- I, I knew what was happening. Like I would be told about periods and stuff, but um, I remember feeling really sad. My mum was really happy, but I just felt really. I think for the first time that that what's happening in my body, I don't have control with what's happening. And um, I'll be honest, I also I was a little bit grossed out. It's a bit of a harsh word, but I wasn't. I definitely wasn't embracing it. I it definitely was more. It was definitely a shock to me. Um, and not a pleasant shock as well. It's not something that I wanted to happen. Now, whether that was I still wanted to be a little girl or I didn't, you know, I wasn't ready for the next phase of what was going to come. But um, I remember it was more shock, but as in a negative way, definitely that feeling of, oh, no, what is this? You know. So, yeah, it wasn't a positive experience for me. How long did it first you take you to get over that initial shock? And did, did it change into a positive at any point? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, it slowly, I think I slowly started to become like more accepting of it. Um, but I mean, I, I absolutely hated wearing pads and I felt like I was wearing a nappy and, um, I used to play hockey and things like that. So I really, it was just really, it was uncomfortable. Um, it wasn't something that I looked forward to, um, and I just found it really messy. Um, so it wasn't, I, I don't think it was a very positive experience early on in in my life. I mean, it, it became one of those things that it was just another thing that happened. Um, and I was quite fortunate not to really struggle with any sort of period pains or things like that. I would often joke with my friends saying, you know, I never know, it, it just comes. Um, so there's never like any PMS signs or things that you read about in magazines. Like I just, it just, it would just be there. And I'd be like, oh shit, here it is. I'm sorry, I don't know if I can swear. I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was just, um, yeah, I, I would say it wasn't a very positive, like, relationship with that. And I think as well, just given growing up, and obviously my mum always would educate us and, you know, she, she'd be she'd be available to talk to. So we were able to talk to her about these things. But it was also something that wasn't spoken about a lot. 
if that makes sense. So it wasn't necessarily coming from her. I just think it was society in general. Just you just don't talk about your periods and things like that. And it's it's something that you sh- that's quite gross and you shouldn't. Not not saying you shouldn't have them because they happen. Like that's just what happens. But it's almost like that was the feeling that I had around it. So not very positive. <laughs> Well, growing up in South Africa, why don't you think that these things were spoken about? I think it's very conservative um, in nature, very traditional, very, um, yeah, I mean, and I did grow up in a bit of a conservative home as well. So you just don't talk about that. Just like you don't really, you know, we, we don't really in general talk about sex and things like that. And I remember um, I went to this lady, this sounds really weird, <laughs> but a group of me, well, me and a group of friends, we went to this because back then as well, schools didn't offer sex education or talking about things. I mean, it was very, very conservative. Um, and sex was almost like a bad word, if you know what I mean. And we went to this lady, probably when I was about in standard five, so that's the end of our primary school years. So I think it was about year seven here. And she, that was like my first introduction to what happens in your body and sex and your periods and things like that. Um it was just, it's just really bizarre in terms of, I think it's like the whole mindset of obviously parents, you know, well, definitely my parents and friends of my parents, you know, my parents, my friends' parents as well. You just don't talk about this. They kind of outsourced it to somebody else to tell us about. Um, so it's just not something that I think, and I think even if I had to speak to my mum now, it's not something that she would have spoken about, really. I can't imagine speaking openly about it. It's just something that happens and this is how we deal with it and we move on. Do you think your views have changed? Do you feel like you're, I mean, you're on the show today talking yeah. about it. <laughs> um, so let me ask, let me change the question. What made you more open to talking about periods and menstruation? I think it's just kind of the change, various factors. I think it's obviously the change of times. Like we're a lot more open in terms of what we speak about it's a normal part of being a woman. Why would we have to shun it or try and hide it? Um, I think as well as a former teacher as well, and also working with young girls and sometimes in year six girls having their first period. And, you know, it's all of those, like those feelings that come up. And I think it's, it's definitely, and it's still a journey for myself. So obviously I'm a lot more open to it and this is just who I am and it's what my body does. Um, so I think it, it's, and it's also obviously educating myself, like the books I read, magazines, and just what you see in the media. And I suppose what I choose to follow and consume on my social media is very much pro and supportive and, and opening, you know, being able to embrace all of these areas. So for me, if I look at my media, social media feed, it's kind of like, that's my world. Do you know what I mean? Um, so it doesn't make the conversation taboo. And I think it's just, why aren't we talking about this? You know, why is it not just a normal thing? It's not gross. It's not disgusting. Um, it can be painful, but it's it's part of, of who we are. You know, I mean, it fascinates me. I'm not very in. I'm not as informed as what I'd like to be, but I do have a friend who is very much in tune with her cycle. And I think even becoming self-employed really highlights to me how my cycle impacts my day-to-day work and what I do. Um, Putting with that though, I'm still unlearning a lot of habits, moving from the teaching world and the push, push, push and the grind, grind, grind and all of that. But I'm aware as well that there are certain times in the month when, okay, this is probably when you're feeling like this is not, this has got to do a lot more with what's going on inside of you versus what's going on outside of you. So just even having that as power. And I think being able to educate people now about that and young girls about that. Golly, if I had this at school, when I was in primary school even, you know, just even in a simple format, I just think it would change so much in terms of how people move forward, um, men and women, you know, um, which is just as knowledge and knowledge is empowerment, you know. just want to go back to what you said about um, being self-employed and working around your menstrual cycle. Can you give us a few or an example of how you've been able to put that into practice? I know you said it's a work in progress, but (laughs) in terms of what you've started doing, can you talk us to us a little bit about that? I think the main thing at the moment, and I'm definitely not as good as my friend because she is brilliant in terms that she would, not all the time, but she would 
kind of track where she books in talks and speaking gigs versus when she doesn't. Um, and I'm not like that because I'm like, well, <laughs> they won't be yeah. any there, do you know what I mean? Um, but I think the main thing for me at the moment is, and like I said, it's work in progress, is becoming aware of the mindset. So for me, in the onset too, when my when my period's about to start, I know I am hypersensitive. The negative thoughts are increasingly a lot more, um, more so than what they would normally be. The anxiety, the feelings of anxiety are higher. And even, I guess, it comes up with me when I do my workouts because I love exercise, I love fitness, um, and not pushing myself. But probably the most, I'd say, it's not being giving myself such a hard time if I can't do what I've intended to set out to do because actually I realize, okay, this is my body and listening to my body. So then perhaps having days where it's low impact exercises versus repetitive high impact kind of things or just going for a slow run um, is probably a large, how at the moment, how I see myself adapting to that. Um, But I would love to get to the point of being able to book my work around my cycle because I think I'd be... It would be phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> I I have to say, even though that this is this is the work that I do, I, I haven't got to that point either because I just you know I, when the work comes, you know you need to do the work. Uh, but you know it's definitely a work a work in progress. Some months you're able to do it, but the fact that you're able to think about your cycle when you're you exercise, I think is really really important um i was actually speaking to an athlete um today and she was we were talking about menstrual cycle and i was talking about how um and the importance for athletes and any anyone who does like a lot of exercise to think about their menstrual cycle because there are times in your cycle like the first half where you put a, you're more likely to put on muscle because yeah. of the rising estrogen and testosterone, but you have more energy towards for those things. Whereas in the second half of your cycle, um, where you have the rising estrogen and progesterone, that's actually the time for cardiovascular exercise, and you're more likely to make cardiovascular gains then. Yeah. That's really interesting. But it makes sense, though, because if I think about the times when I really – want to go for a run there's like just that like internally I'm like I cannot face doing high reps high hit workouts it's like I just want something that's going to move my body but in a slow and steady space so it's not even like sprints or things like that it's just a slow steady run or low impact work perhaps you know like maybe like with, I think when the gyms were open I'd maybe incorporate more of a leg day but with no jumps and just kind of keep it really you know low base you know low low intensity based and I think that to me has been a big thing because don't know I mean ever since my teens it's always been I've had a lot of like there's been a lot of work in terms of me and my relationship with the body I mean like a lot of other girls and men as well um so it's been a real thing for me to unlearn that I don't have to be killing it in every single workout in order to to have some positive benefits from that you know, and that's a really long journey because for a very long time that was like, right, I've got to just like max it out and like do as many and do you know what I mean? And actually it's not, it's not constructive. Um, yeah, sorry. And just also to say, I mean, like what you were saying there about your work in progress as well. I think the main thing is just, it is having that awareness. And I think ideally I'd love to be able to book in speaking gigs and like, the world goes according to my cycle, you know, <laughs> yeah. I don't always think that that's, that's available because it's like the work comes in, but it's in, okay, how do I show up knowing that maybe it's day one or I really, all I want to do is be in bed. So what can I do to be gentle with myself? You know, following what I have to do, if I have to perform right. Okay. Understanding. And then, you know, what can I do to be gentle with myself versus beating myself up? That is such an amazing point. I think that cycle awareness is so is such an important part of understanding how you can be gentle with yourself. And also this idea of tenderness, knowing that you're on day one. And so you, you know, it varies for everyone, but you know, you might, your energy is likely to be lower 
than it is, say, in day midway through your cycle. So no matter what you have what you have to do, how can you show up for yourself in the gentlest, most tender way possible yeah yeah absolutely which if i'm still it's still a work in progress it's, yeah. still in progress. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite funny because even today i got a little um i got the, i think it's the moody app and i'm still learning to figure out how it works but it, i just i haven't got into it yet but a little notification came up saying it's a good time to remember to be sensitive and gentle with yourself today. And I was like, oh, this makes sense. Because this morning, everything was on full flow in my brain. And like all these things were going, oh, like, all right. Okay, so it's just, and it's just having that as an awareness, you know. Um, I love the Moody app. I, the team there is amazing. So it's brilliant that, that you're using it. Um, but I think just going back to what you were saying about how before your period, you get these heightened thoughts of uh, you know anxious thoughts or self-doubt do you feel are you more aware now that there that those things are happening and the second part of the question is what do you do to to help yourself in those moments yeah I do um I definitely notice I'm more aware that it's happening um, so whilst it doesn't stop the negative chatter or those feelings coming up, I'm like, I know why this is happening because I'm coming closer. So that's my, my form of PMS. And also that I get really, the older I've gotten, the more teary I get as well, definitely the more emotional I get. Um, and I mean, in terms of what helps me, well, it's always, I've, I've always struggled with anxiety as a child. And I think into adulthood as well, but it's been, it's been quite manageable, but it, it is there. Do you know what I mean? I was, I was diagnosed with depression in my early teens and into my twenties, but I've definitely been able to manage it and to work with it. But in those times, especially I've noticed as I've become older, because when I was young as well, I didn't really notice so much of the change between not being on my period and being on my period. It just kind of flowed into one. It was definitely more gradual. Whereas now it's like, night and bloody day it's like who is this person um but it always comes back to doing those things that I know will keep me grounded so that is about not looking at my phone first thing in the morning um doing some meditation or mindfulness exercises where I just get to like sit and like just center my mind and just kind of quieten things down um exercise in the morning is really important as well I find that if I don't exercise whether that is even yoga or just anything in terms of moving my body, the mental chatter, those feelings are definitely a lot more heightened. Um, and I've gotten into such a routine. I've been doing it for years in the morning. So I know that that always sets me up to be clearer headed. So even if I wake up and I'm in this fog, if I do the exercise, I'm like, oh, well, right. What was that about? Like literally it's like a night and day again in terms of how it helps. Um, and I think. So that's what I do, and that I try and do as consistently as possible. Um, I must be honest, since lockdown, it's been a lot harder for me to kind of have that routine because my husband's at home. So the, there's just more distraction in terms of, because before, you know, we'd get up, I'd meditate, we'd go to the gym together, there'd be the structure, whereas now we're sleeping a bit later and all of these sort of things. So I've definitely noticed a, a bit of a dip but in saying that when I come back to the meditations and even if I do them a bit later um I find that that really really does help um and then even using some other strategies in terms of okay well what is it that I'm thinking what are these negative thoughts let's put them down and what I teach the children let's look for evidence as to why these are not true let's look for clues as to why this thought you're thinking no one's going to buy your program is not true do you know what I mean like all this yeah. stuff that you come up with um but yeah it, I think it, yeah definitely the meditation exercise movement and then challenging that negative chatter and talking back in a more compassionate way in a more rational way as well so it sounds like that you've got a, a lot of tools in your arsenal and you're very you're very aware mm. um, I want to just go back to what you were saying about sport and you played a lot of sport when you were younger um, and you're very you do a lot of physical activity now mm -hmm. you've talked about we talked a little bit about how um your menstrual cycle might impact your performance did you notice when you were younger the impact of sport on your 
period on your menstrual cycle? No, 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 no. I think, like I said, to me, my period was very light. It was also maybe three days or four days. It was very, very light. Um, and I never really ne- noticed this PMS that people were talking about. Cause I'm like, I don't have that. Um, and I quite brag about that. And I'm like, oh, gosh, it's come back. <laughs> um, but I think, no. And I think, you know, that the sports, so I played hockey in high school and I did some running cross country and things like that in tennis, but never excessively. I think when I started going to the gym in my twenties, that's when I started to get quite, um, punishing even I think might be the thing and high impact and then I qualified to be a fitness instructor so I taught of years um, at um, a couple of the Virgin Active and gym box and again the ethos and those and you know it's very much go 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 push 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 um, which I loved but it's not something that is sustainable but um, mm. I think it was more so it didn't have an impact on my periods it was more my mental how my mental health in terms of beating myself and like I'm exhausted and I'm tired and why I've done like 10 burpees and that's it or whatever it might be if that's just started and you're dead um and not recognizing and being in tune and actually yeah. um, and it's funny because I had a conversation with a friend at the gym where she was pushing herself and then when I asked her where she was in her cycle I was like well that's why but it was mm. an eye-opener for her because again you know we don't get taught about this if you're not actively looking um I, yeah we don't get taught about this stuff and it's it's so valuable in so many different ways and I think this narrative that I've been seeing at the moment is there's a lot of conversation about the importance of periods but some people questioning why we need to have a period in the first place and you know it's it's hard to kind of have a counterpoint to those conversations because they you know that they're coming from a very m- masculine mindset of the world in terms of masculine energy and that go 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 that you described whereas we see that you know menstruation that cycle is so it's a cycle and there are ebbs and flows um but i wanted to just kind of switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about um, your you your work as a teacher and the work that how you transitioned into your company because you mentioned some of the tools that you use around for you, the anxious thoughts that you have and how you've been able to um, teach children these tools. Talk a little bit about that. Mm, so yeah, I um. So I qualified as a teacher, primary school back in South Africa. I've also got a background in D. So I really wanted to go into um, so the field of psychology. So um, after my yeah teaching degree is four years, so I decided that was an extra fifth year. And then I thought, well, I'll come over to the UK because that's what all South Africans were doing back then, which was, golly, 2006, I think. Um, but then I ended up staying here and I loved it because I was like, well, I don't want to go back. And then I also realized, actually... I love the mind, I love personal development, I love all of that, but I don't quite know if I want to go into psychology as such, like I initially thought. Um, But I knew I didn't want to be a teacher because I was teaching and I just, just, it just didn't gel. It just wasn't, I knew like inside, there's like, there's something else. And I'm like, well, what the hell is this? Because I like literally (laughs) was like trying all different things. I mean, like I said, I then dabbled a bit in the fitness industry. So I, because I loved it. So I trained to be an instructor and I taught like, fight club and spin and body pump and all sorts of things but again it wasn't something I could see myself doing long term and then the school I was with sent me on a coaching course thinking initially it was PE coaching physical education but when I got the documents it was a taster to become a life coach with some company and I loved it I was like a life coach back then was very woo woo like what is you know very kind of like what is this um but I absolutely loved it because it covered the field of psychology and personal development but it was about helping people move forward and so um I was actually in the middle of thinking at that point do I because I was exploring becoming a personal trainer but then the coaching qualification came up and I was like I'm actually going to do that so I signed up with the coaching academy and I did that Um, And then I thought, well, I mean, I was still teaching full time, obviously. Um, And I thought, well, let me work with women making career changes like myself. 
So I tried that out for a couple of years on the side, but again, it just didn't gel. And people used to tell me, why don't you use your tools with children? But at that point, I was like, no, I want to leave education. I'm so tired of this. I like want to leave school. Um, and it was only pure by fluke where I had to, I was required to teach an after school club. And I thought, well, I'll call it mindfulness because I've been on a mindfulness training session. Um, but I'm going to get the kids to color in so I can mark books. That was honestly my strategy. That was really, my, and, and like I did it for maybe about two sessions. But then one of the children said to me, they were really stressed about their year six exams coming up. And I'd actually come off a stress training day that I absolutely loved. So, I mean, on the spot there, I was teaching them about their brain and what happens when you get stressed. And I was like, are they going to get this? And the feedback I got from parents following that session was like, whatever you're doing, please carry on. You know, my daughter's coming home saying like she's using these tools to help her with her worries. What is this? Can you carry on with it? So then I slowly started to try different strategies, like basically apply my coaching tools into lessons for children. And um, that ultimately was when I guess Power Thoughts, the idea for Power Thoughts came. So Power Thoughts is a coaching program that I, or coaching service that I created to help children initially tap into the power of their own thoughts um, and to help them recognize they don't have to believe every thought they think or respond to everything they feel. Um, and ultimately giving them the tools to manage their mindset. So I know we work close with a very dear friend, Lucy Sheridan, because um, yeah. Lucy's always been on my radar. We've been friends. And I knew she was doing this brand mentoring at the stage. And I said to her, I've got this idea to bring personal development to children, but I need help. And that's really where we started to then put ideas together and, you know, the name came about. Um, so, I mean, it's been quite a journey and it really is. And it's so funny because I remember years ago prior to this, I used to say, I love teaching, but I want to teach what I'm passionate about and, and doing it. And I'm like, it's so because I've got goosebumps because I never would have believed that I you know, would, would be doing what I'm doing. But for me, it's really important because I think, you know, as an adult, I know how I struggle with negative thoughts and, you know, feelings of anxiety. And I know not everybody does, but we all have self-doubts. We all have those times when we question our abilities. We all have those, the imposters that creep up or we don't feel confident. But we create all these negative stories about that. And these are stories that we've held on to for years. Whereas if we could start to teach children from the age of six, seven, eight, that just because you're not getting maths so it's difficult in maths doesn't mean you're rubbish with numbers doesn't mean you're stupid you know you can start to rewrite that story um so it's all about bringing kind of the tools that we, you know we classically use with adults but making them into bite-sized teachable activities for children just to start developing positive habits as i say you know from a younger age or more helpful thinking habits really um and how to respond to things and just being more emotionally aware because I don't think I, I wasn't taught about emotions the way, you know, I know about it now. And I know how vital it would have been if I was. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you feel like kids are more anxious these days and um, you're having to really dig into that a bit more rather than the kind of more positive um, reinforcement side of what you do? Mm, I think, um, well, I, I mean, obviously with COVID and all of that, yes, there's been a high, like a spike in anxiety. There's, there's been a lot of, because of all the uncertainty, of course. But I mean, prior to that, I do think there's a lot already on children's plates now versus when I was a child, even when I was teaching, when I first started teaching, you know, the curriculum has changed. So it's definitely, I mean, I've been out of teaching now for three and a half, four years, but back then like the curriculum had changed a lot and it was really challenging um so I think their plates are a lot more full and also bring in online and social media and it's not something that we can choose our children not to be engaged in because actually they need to learn because that's part of the modern world and we want to give them the skills to deal with that in a positive way um so their plates are full so I think, yes, to a degree there is, but then also on the flip side, I think we're talking about it a lot more now. Whereas in the past, it was probably also there, but we just didn't talk about it. Just like we didn't talk about periods, we didn't talk about mental health, we didn't talk about our feelings. You were taught to like suck it up and get on with it. You know, like just, just let's not show, it was not the right thing to show 
mental, you know, like mental challenges or things like that. Um, so I think it's a bit of both. Mm. Um, now, you know, and especially I find, I mean, just within the world of education, I set up power thoughts when mindfulness was just starting to make its appearance in education. But I know it was some schools embraced it and some schools were completely, no, we don't want to go down this route because there might be religious schools and this has got attachment to all sorts of other beliefs. Um, so it was definitely, I think, I kind of sometimes find like it was a bit slower to be introduced versus say, I know mindfulness was really in the corporate sector and it was quite well embraced. So I think, sorry, going back to your question, I think it's a bit of both really um their plates are full but i think we're talking about it more we're allowing the space to talk about it if there were a parent listening who would say i i i love i love this um what's something i could do today to because you know more parents including myself are homeschooling and they're seeing kind of the kitchen sink of what it's like to to teach a child <laughs> you know what what's and all I have to say here there have been tantrums from me and from my son um what advice would you give to parents who you know there are a lot of kids aren't going to go back to school this year um to manage this time and to um you know keep keep a cool head Mm, I think, yeah, definitely. I think first of all, and it goes back to what I said ages ago um, in some interview, this is not homeschooling, right? Homeschooling is where you choose to take your child out of the system and you choose to be their primary. I mean, you already are their primary educator, but you choose to step into that teacher role. You've not chosen this. This is kind of being thrown at you in like a matter of like 48 hours, right? You've got to deal with it. So understand that it's not, you're not being the teacher. You're not expected to know how to do the divisions, the fractions, adverbial, whatever, frontal verbs, whatever they're called. Yeah. <laughs> remove that, you know, remove that. I mean, by now from talking to parents and so forth, there does seem to be a bit of a structure in place. Because I do think, you know, structure is important. Absolutely for children, especially, you know, let children know what's to be expected. So, um, but keep it, keep it quite simple. I think the key word here is keep it simple. If schools, and again, this depends on the age of the child, um, the subject, what schools are sending. And if schools are sending a lot of things and you're feeling overwhelmed, pick one thing. Pick one mm. thing and focus on that. Rather do one thing well versus 10 little things and they're all emotional meltdowns. At the end of the day, we've always got to come back to our children feeling and us lowering that stress response, right? Where we're, because if we're in that space of stress and anxiety and anger and those big feelings, nothing's going to get done and it's not a very nice place to be. So if your child is, and it's not about, and I, and it's, <laughs> There's a lot of things here because, yes, some learning needs to be done, but could there be other forms of learning then? If they're really not engaging with the maths, could they perhaps go and, I don't know, sort blocks or buy, gro you know, buy groceries and putting that in inverted commas, you know, so what would you buy? How much would it be? What money? You know, kind of those sort of things. Something that's maybe a bit more practical and hands-on versus the worksheet or the exercise that they do. The other thing as well, I mean, just to remind parents as well, is that children are at school for six hours a day, but they are not learning every single minute of those six hours. And even if they've got an hour of literacy and an hour of maths, they're not working that full 60 minutes because there is a bit of teaching time, there's a bit of carpet time to desk time if they're little. There's can I go to the toilet time? There's a lot of time <laughs> that we're not doing anything, you know? And there's the banter with the friends. So if you're able to do a little maths exercise in 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then they then do something that's a bit more self-focused, that's fine. They don't have to be busy for the full 60 minutes. And I mean, I do see this with a little client that I worked with recently. Um, his school was quite on top form in terms of Zoom lessons. And I think he was at Zoom, like Zoom calls from nine o'clock until two o'clock every day. And I mean, he's eight. Um, but I mean, children are, I mean, what I'm hearing from children, and I think especially now understanding if they're having a hard time, are there some things that you can take off the agenda? Because yeah. the kids I'm talking to are bored with Zoom lessons, mm. the hour sessions, and the, 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 they say the learning is, I mean, and I'm, 
but the learning is boring, which I can totally understand because your attention span is only so much for an hour or, and especially if it's a subject. So it's not quite, it's not something that's always going to be fun and engaging. It's maths or it's how to write a sentence or, I mean, obviously a lot more elaborate than that, but it's, mm. you know what I mean? It, it's, there's only so much. And I think the novelty of being at home is also worn off in the beginning. It might've been quite exciting. They are missing their friends, you know, FaceTime can only go so far. Um, and also in the school day, they burn off a lot of energy. So what I would say is how can you help your child change their state and you as well? So simple things like I, uh, you know, I encourage families to create a power playlist where they put together some songs and if they start to feel songs that they like, like upbeat, funky songs. And if they start to feel like a bit in a funk, right, we're going to choose a song. We're going to dance. We're going to shake. We're going to move it out get rid of that energy, you know, or is it that you, um, something else I teach is called move it to lose it, where I move my body in a safe way to lose the big feeling. So it might be that I set my time on my phone and you've got to run as fast as you can for 30 seconds. And then we're going to go again for 45 seconds. And then we're going to go again for 60 seconds. By round four, children have been like, oh, what was I so upset about? You know, because it's, it's yeah. turned into a game. Um, and even, you know, if you're able to take them outside, like burn, burn some of the energy because they're not burning that much energy. Um, and just in terms of, Something else as well that might be something helpful in terms of ongoing is we can start now to help them build their emotional vocabulary because the richer their emotional vocabulary is, the better they will be able to be to express how they feel and recognize how they feel. And I can't remember where I read it, but um, I read, you know, first of all, I read somewhere that, you know, if we're able to label our feeling, it reduces the intensity of the feeling within the primitive part of the brain but also children and adults who were able to verbalize how they felt um, were 40% less physically and verbally aggressive than those who had a difficult time, you know, figuring things out. So this is something that's ongoing, but something that families could do is even print off a feelings chart, just Google feelings charts on Google, print that off and just put that up in the kitchen or communal area and just have like little conversations about, you know, when did you, where do you, you know, when did you, what does jealousy feel like? Where do you notice jealousy in your body? If you had to give it a color, what color would you give it? Um, you know, what, what, you know, what might help you if you feel jealous, you know, versus if you feel frustrated or if you feel worried or if you feel disappointed and obviously the, 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 the happier emotions as well. But just to start building their emotional vocabulary, because so often children say, I feel happy, sad or mad. But actually, there's a whole wealth of other feelings. And even getting the older ones, I do this with some children where I get them to take joy, for example, come up with as many words for joy as you can, you know, and then let's put them on like a timeline and see from lowest intensity to highest intensity, what might it, and it's just, it's just a way to start slowly building that vocabulary as well, because then the more words they have to express how they feel about things and vice versa with you as well. You have given us so many incredible tools I'm just nodding my head thinking (laughs) I've got to use this I've got to use that uh just just wonderful I like the power playlist I yesterday my son really loves the descendants and (laughs) so we we were we had a little karaoke session in the afternoon um and that was really fun and it was a way of us getting out our energy and like really just, you know, because singing is so joyful yeah. and also it stimulates the vagus nerve. So that is also connected to good emotional health. So yeah, I just, I just love, I just all love all of that. And for listeners, all of these, if you're, if you've, you've written been trying to write these down all of this will be in the show notes and the transcription on my website um but natalie i wanted to ask you if you could leave listeners with one thought to take away today from this podcast what would you want that to be um, the first thing that came to my mind is don't believe every ride, especially when it comes to negative chat of doubt. Um, and this goes, I think, something to our children as well, especially when in terms of the uncertainty and the worry and the anxiety, it could be so caught up in and worrying about what might happen. But let's come back 
to where we are right now, whether that is our breathing techniques or changing our energy state. Um, and I think as well, coupled with that, you know, being gender, this is something I said that I'm still learning. Um, I was having a massive talk with myself upstairs just before I came down to talk. <laughs> and it's just that, you know, you've got to be your own cheerleader. So I know the homeschooling, working from home is incredibly dumb parents. But, you know, at the end of the day, can you find, you know, is there one positive thing of the day? And again, also just the permission slip there to drop all of these things that we feel we should do. Primarily, I think what's important is you being able to pay the bills, so your job. And then, so if that means the schoolwork's not going to get done the way it would be done, that's okay. Sorry, I think I've given you two there, not one. <laughs> no, I, both are brilliant. Both are, are really important. Where can listeners get in touch with you to find out more about the work that you do and how you help children? Yeah, sure. So, um, on my website, uh, www.powerthoughts.uk. Um, I'm, on, I'm on Instagram a lot, so that's just at powerthoughtsnc, so nposter. Um, so those are the two. I mean, I'm on Instagram the most, obviously Facebook as well, but I'm mostly over on Instagram. So, um, yes, and if you go to my website, you can pop me a message on there or use my DMs as well. <laughs> 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 brilliant and all of this this will be in the show notes and the transcripts thank you so much for coming on to the show natalie it's been it's been brilliant and i'll definitely be using the things that you mentioned oh, thank you so much for having me it's been so lovely to chat with you thank you For more inspiring conversations, head over to periodstorypod.com where we have so many more for you to peruse. If you want help with your menstrual or hormone health, email me on hello at eatlovemove.com to set up a free 30-minute hormone health review. If you like today's show, please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Tag us, come say hi, and send in your requests for who you'd like to see on the show on Instagram and Twitter on at periodstorypod or email us at hello at periodstorypod.com. I'm Lenise Brothers, and you've been listening to Period Story. Thank you so much for listening.